Hey everyone, what is up? It's Tuesday, it's 12, you know what that means. We are live in Randy's office answering your questions. Uh, you might recognize me if you watch the Monday morning Facebook Live of the Spiritual Workout of the Day or from past Tuesdays at 12. My name is Austin, I'm our digital marketing and video production coordinator here, filling in for Kim as she is out this week. She should be back next week, uh, I, I would, would think. I would think, yeah. And then you can have a much preferable experience on <laughs> Tuesdays at 12. <laughs> but for a week, you are stuck with me. <laughs> um, but yeah, not a ton of questions today, but we got a few. If you have any as we're talking, feel free to put those in the comments. But for now, we'll get right to it. Okay. Uh, so our first question is, this may be putting the cart ahead of the horse, they say, but are there plans or anything being discussed for the end of this age regarding our church community? If we are the blessed generation to see the second coming, will the church provide shelter or a form of of a quote village for the be- lack of a better word during the judgments um, this is a really good question and I guess it's been I don't know three or four years ago uh, I, I was quietly meeting with a small group of people uh, considering this very thing because it bothered me greatly um, knowing what time we, we are likely at and uh, being concerned what what might occur with our people, you know, and, and so we we met for some weeks, we strategized various things, and sadly the conclusion was we couldn't come up with a way that we could um, really, really take care of the entire congregation for any number of reasons. Um, we were also quite concerned that we didn't want to create some panic, we didn't want, sure. to, want to become known either as the, uh, oh, it's the weird <laughs> Jesus is coming church, you know. Uh, so... What I tried to do then is very quietly, once again, uh, start some things in motion that would um, allow our people on an individual level to be as prepared as they felt led to be prepared. For example, I had uh, my daughter do a thing where uh, she came in and she taught uh, the church what the Red Cross recommends, you know, and then we added to the list and we gave um, a lot of resources to people where they could uh, find products and things if they wanted to be. In other words, Red Cross might say something like, hey, be prepared with supplies for three days. Sure. And we said, hey, in case you're thinking maybe three months, here's some places you can go to get some supplies. And that's what I've kind of quietly advocated is, boy, you know, we could have any kind of a emergency of, you know, it could be an ice storm and the power goes out for two yeah. months. Try to think in terms of what your life would be like without electricity and if you can, uh, prepare for at least two or three months because that will at least give you time to pause, catch your breath, have some objectivity as opposed to being swept up in a panic and um, sure. maybe swept into a FEMA camp or something <laughs> like that. Um, you know, Christians differ on this matter. There are some Christians that because of their trust in Christ, they feel like that they are led not to prepare mm-hmm. and that whatever they face, that's okay. Uh, others, because of their faith in Christ, are led to prepare, some extensively, some minimally. And I'm comfortable with that. And so, unfortunately, though, we um, it was a logistical impossibility to, to care for the whole congregation to the level that it would be necessary if, you know, the scenario occurs. So, All right, yeah. Great question, though. Um, and so we'll move on to the next question. It's going to feel like a bit of a jump. <laughs> but they were kind of all over the place this week. This one just says, can we add a music link to the app for the band? The music is so good at FCF. Thanks. <laughs> we should really work to get it out to the more to the public and members. Yeah, uh, we we used to do this some years back, and and it requires um, a lot of consideration. You have to you have to consider um, legalities because we are singing other people's music, sure. and sometimes if you then put that out, you're undercutting their sales, and uh, you get into all kind of liability things. Uh, it also requires a remixing. What we hear in the auditorium on a Sunday morning has to be remixed. Uh, each instrument, each vo- vocalist uh, the, has to be remixed just a little bit if you're going to put it into the form of something that people can listen to from a device. Yeah. It doesn't sound the same as it's when you're... It's not quite as forgiving. N- as no, it's, it's not at all. And right now, we, because of those reasons, we just don't feel like we can do it adequately. It's not to say that we won't in the future, and I agree with this person. I'd love for our music to be out there a bit more. Uh, legally, of course, and well mixed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Legally and sounding good. Yes. Um, but thanks for the compliment to the music. And yeah, so it's it's a thing that'd be nice to do, but probably mm-hmm. not right now at this time. Um, if you do in the interim want to watch back the music, you can go to the 
Sunday live on the website and you can watch a few services back and I'll have the full service including the music. But again, it's not going to be mixed properly for that experience. It's mixed for the auditorium. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, the, the sound on those live uh, broadcasts, it's not terrible. No. It's just not quite the same. And it's not uh, it's, its not what we would want to send it right. But, but having said that, if you had a friend and you said, hey, man, just check out this church. Yeah. And you wanted them to get a get an a experience of our music. It's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. Yep. So that is a place to find it in the interim. Um, next question is um, kind of another interesting one I guess Uh, so the person says so I live in a rental home and my car is old and in need of repair (laughs) all right been there I know (laughs) know that one I got yeah I think I got 208,000 miles on my car Uh, right now my car is currently (laughs) not cooperating itself but uh, I could keep pouring money into it to get it fixed but I guess my question is this am I being ungrateful by asking God for a financial blessing for a home instead of a rental and a new car or something more reliable than what I have is it wrong to ask God for stuff like this no, uh, as long as you're willing to work for it. <laughs> uh, I'm serious. As long, it, it comes down to if you're willing to work for it and if you feel that these are you know, more or less necessities, and I want to be careful that we're necessities, but you, you feel these are legitimate, uh, wise investments for you and maybe your family at this point. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Um, Stay within your means. Don't get yourself crazy in debt. You know that yeah. that would be my recommendation. Uh, you know, old, old cars are funny. I mean, sometimes the best investment in the world is to keep fixing that old car. Yeah. Because when you compare that with a new car payment, which I advocate to anyone, do not buy a new car. Buy a car that's three years old. Okay. Yeah. Because you're just you're just paying for you know way too much. Then uh, anyway. Um, you know, sometimes patching up that old car, man, it's the best best investment in the world. And then they do reach a stage where it just gets ridiculous because yeah. you never know when you're going to be stranded on the highway. And in today's society, most of us can't function that way. Yeah. So, you know, if it's time to buy a new used car, my I really advocate a new used car, not a new new car. Go for it. Yeah. You know, don't feel guilty. So. And as a little bit of a uh, plug there as we're on financial things, I believe growth group registration is still open this week and we have a great uh, class here Financial Peace University yes. they will tell you all about why you should not buy that new car <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they will they have a lot of good things to teach uh, biblical ideas on handling your finances and such so if you haven't taken that I might recommend that yeah it, people just rave anybody that's ever gone through that class just says it's, it's a life changer you know yeah. as far as getting uh, control over your finances, getting out of debt, not having that, you know, as that strangle around your neck. So um, that, that's a great opportunity for people. Yeah. All right. So next question, um, they say, my question is this. I know why God commanded Israel to tithe and why tithing is in the Old Testament. However, I tithe because I believe in the call of my church and their mission. I don't give because I feel commanded to. Are Christians today commanded to tithe like in the Old Testament with the 10% and all or are we to give out of our hearts? It, it's an interesting question, and um, he, he, here, here's the answer. Anybody that has children would understand this a little more easily than someone that doesn't. When you have children, for example, you might give them an allowance. Mm-hmm. And so you say, okay, now, now here's your dollar, and, um, but we want to give, uh, you know, so, so maybe you give it to them in dimes to teach the lesson if the child is mm-hmm. ready to say, so well, we want you have 10 dimes, we want it to give this dime first before you spend any of your other nine dimes. We want to give that to God and His work. Mm-hmm. And that's based on what He teaches in His Word. So when He established tithing in the Old Testament, it was very much like that. Uh, they were in their childhood state of what does it mean to be God's people? What does it mean to be those that are going to carry out the work of God on the planet? And so He gave them very concrete, easy things. And so they could give that 10%. There, They were told to give the first 10% up front, and they could see, ah, the work of God thrives when we do this, and we ourselves have all we need. We can trust God with this, you know. So it was meant to be that kind of a situation. Now, all the way up until Jesus' day, the 1,450 years from Moses to Jesus, or close to 1,500, um, Israelites all practiced that. When Jesus was on earth, he himself practiced tithing. He advocated tithing. He even said to the uh, Pharisees that attacked him, he said, you know, you guys think you're all that because you tithe. He says, but you forget the weightier matters like loving God, loving people, stuff like that. But he never said, don't tithe. He just said, you know, there's stuff besides that. So then you get to the rest of the New Testament, and to be very honest, it's, it's completely silent 
about tithing. Yeah. But what you do have are numerous passages where people are giving in the early book of Acts. People are giving profusely, man. They're going way past way the tithe. 10%. Oh, yeah. They're selling their houses and everything to provide because people were clumped together in Jerusalem right after uh, Pentecost, and they literally needed support. And uh, then you get the Macedonian Christians in 2 Corinthians 9. It says that, or 2 Corinthians 8, out of their deep poverty, they gave way more, Paul says, than, you know, what they even should have, you know, but it's, it's not uh, restricted. So here's the way I've always answered this through the years, because <laughs> this, this is where this question always gets kind of funny. There's so many people, uh, you got to understand, man, I've talked with a lot of people through the years, sure. you know, been in ministry a long time. Um, there's so many people that will bring this issue up. And they bring it up, and, and their, their notion is always that they feel like God doesn't want us to give that much now, since it doesn't say anything in the New Testament. And um, my response is that, you know, you're right, give from your heart. But we don't have any example in the Bible where giving less than 10% is ever pleasing. I mean, God's goal in this thing is that we would be generous like he is generous. The only way I know to become generous is to give. If somebody can show me some other way to become generous, I'm all waiting for that. So what I always urge people to do is to be very cautious. Examine your own heart. And uh, although there's not some legalistic command in the New Testament, uh, and this person certainly sounds like their heart is in the right place that they give because they want to support the work of God, you know, and they believe in, in FCF's part in that. That's the right attitude. And, uh, you know, I, I think the 10% is a tremendously helpful guideline that, yeah. that, that, that you can call it a starting point. Now, it's not a starting point for a lot of folks because they, they hear, you know, they, they put their trust in Christ and then they get to these portions and they're like, w give what? <laughs> what? No, <laughs> no, man, you should have told me that up front, you know. Uh, that fine print? Exactly. <laughs> so to be very honest, uh, there are a lot of people that they're not prepared for this. And so we urge them, hey, uh, start trusting God, set an amount each year. You know, maybe say, okay, this year, by God's grace, I'm going to give 3%, and each year I'm going to do my best to try to uh, elevate that. And then just trust God and, and let it happen. So, I, I mean, don't get all guilty feeling if you're not giving at least 10%, but I would urge people to um, look at that 10% as, as, as a good standard. It's something to go by as a starting point. But um, no, no legal commandment, you know. Nice. Yeah, I think that was a very good answer to that. I'm going to break before that next question because we have okay. one coming on the stream before we get back to uh, the second coming. <laughs> okay. But uh, two people, it seems, asked, is there any reason why we don't show Fusion Velocity lessons online? And I guess I could probably answer that for them. I'm glad because uh, I don't know the answer. We don't record them <laughs> at this point, um, although I will say we did just have Revive 2018, which was the uh, Fusion and Velocity spring retreat which went we had over 200 kids there a yeah. bunch of them signed up to get baptized it was a great experience and those messages were recorded um, i haven't had a chance to go back and look at them but there's a chance those might end up online but as far as why we don't right now it's not that we're hiding what goes on over here. We, just, <laughs> no. uh, we don't have the uh, logistic ability to do that at this point but maybe one day down the road yeah it's actually an uh, interesting thought yeah you know, we, we just yeah, we haven't had the means, nor had we even considered it. So. Yeah, good question, though. Yes. I'm glad you want to see them. Um, doing that's that's one of the people here. that gives the messages. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get famous over here at FCF. 15 seconds. No, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, back to the set of questions we have. And again, if you have more questions, let us know. We don't have a whole lot of them today. But this person said, prior to the second coming, do you believe that the trumpet sounding is literal, or is it likely that with today's technology, it will be an alarm or worldwide <laughs> message of some sort? No, I believe it's going to be literal because um, it's targeted so many times in Scripture. And you have examples in the Old Testament where trumpets were always the signal for God's people to be gathered in uh, the book of Thessalonians. Uh, First Thessalonians, it says that it's the call of the archangel and the trump of God. In Matthew 24, it talks about the trumpet. So I believe it will be a, a real trumpet blast of sorts. you got to understand, this is not like our earthly trumpet. Yeah, this is something from heaven. So I think it will probably be quite loud. Uh, interesting, the question that always comes to my mind is, will it only be heard uh, by those that belong to Christ or will it be heard by the whole world? And the scripture doesn't tell us that part. So, uh, but anyway, I think it will be a real trumpet. Yeah. 
I have to say, you know, this isn't a very theological statement here, but if it was just like a text message, it'd be a little <laughs> anticlimactic. It's like, this is the end of it all? <laughs> right. <laughs> Come on, I wanted a little more than that. Yes, yes. <laughs> like, my phone's yeah, on vibrate, that's th- right. Yeah, I think, <laughs> think we can safely say it. it'll be a little more than that. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, so this next person uh, said, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says that all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, etc., they say. My question is, when I read First Chronicles 1 through 9, that has a lot of genealogical history of names that I struggle to pronounce. <laughs> Fair point. I just don't understand the point lesson of it. Please help me to understand what I'm missing. Well, um, Scripture talks a lot about God wants to give us rest, and so these are portions of Scripture that put you to sleep. <laughs> there you go. The bedtime and, stories. And they create humility because you can't pronounce the names. You know, So there, there's the value of them right there. Now, all kidding aside, uh, they're... I don't want anybody to get bogged down in these portions of scriptures. You know, if you hit one of these portions of scriptures and you're just like, feel like you're wasting your time, go to other parts of the Bible that are going to give you a lot more information about God, about life, and that kind of thing. And then you can come back and take some of this in. Here's the value. Uh, first of all, it shows how detail oriented the God of the Bible is, how historically um, rooted this is. Th- this is not some fanciful book of principles. Th- this sure. is rooted in history. It shows also God really cares about individuals. He knows us by name. I mean, Scripture talked about He knows the hair on our head and so forth. Um, so this amplifies that. The other thing is, is, is these genealogies play into the ultimate full revelation of God given in Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, These genealogies all connect up in one way or another to Him. Uh, it was predicted he would come through, you know, the Davidic lineage. And these genealogies are usually chaining this stuff together to show the Jews very carefully. And that the scripture, even over this, this huge period of time, this chain is consistent. And, uh, and so they have to do with f- fulfillment of prophecy. They, they have to do with the uh, accuracy and historicity of the Bible. So even though they can be a little boring, you know, when you first come across them, you go back later on, after you've kind of gotten the big picture of Scripture, you go back and you read some of those, you'll find yourself going, whoa, that guy or that, that lady or that phrase that was woven in with those genealogies. Mm-hmm. And, and so you will be surprised at, at what's there. Having said that, don't get bogged down. You know, if, if you're new to the Bible, go to the... Uh, the meteor portions that are going to be meaningful to you now. What I always urge people, new Bible readers do, is uh, literally start in the New Testament, not the Old Testament, because mm-hmm. Christ is meant to be the, the interpretive lens through which we see the Old Testament. We're Westerners. We're used to starting in the beginning of a book and reading right through, but what you have to understand, the Bible is not one book, it's 66 books. Yeah. And the lens of Christ in the New Testament opens our understanding of who the God is in the Old Testament and why He does what He does because sometimes it might seem perplexing. It's progressive revelation. So start, I tell people, you know, start in the New Testament, maybe read the shortest gospel. There's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read Mark. It's short. Mm-hmm. From there, go to all the little books in the New Testament. By little, I mean six chapters or less. You'll learn so much so fast. Then if you want to go back and read Genesis, man, Genesis is cool. It's, it's, yeah. it's narrative. It, it is amazing. And maybe go on into Exodus even, because it's still a lot of narrative, you know, the forming of the nation of Israel, the Exodus from Egypt, and so forth. From there, maybe drop back into the New Testament, pick up some of the larger books in the New Testament, Book of Acts, 28 chapters, you know. You, that, that's the early beginning of the New Testament church spreading from Jerusalem. Uh, you may want to read Romans, you know, it's a 16th chapter, 1 Corinthians 16th chapter. So, bouncing back and forth like that when you're, you're beginning to read the Bible, it's actually a good practice. You'll get a lot of knowledge quick. You'll get your feet under you for then when you go back and read some of the more thorny historical passages, they'll actually be more meaningful to you. So, yeah. In fact, we have a guide that we developed man, over 20 years ago that um, it, it's accessible that gives our little formula that we suggest for people just starting to read the Bible, and it kind of follows that pattern I just gave. Yeah, so. I believe I have that somewhere. I might be able to make that available. If, uh, mm-hmm. they, if you message our Facebook account, I'll try to get that to you. Um, but yeah, and I think it just takes a lot of humility reading the Bible because it's not like any other book that you're going to read. Yes. You expect to pick it up and read it like a self-help book or something, and it's all yes. going to speak to you. Yes. And then you run into a genealogy. That's <laughs> um, it. But yeah. it's written over a really long period of time, and yeah. all these different authors, all these different types of literature, it really does take kind of yes. some humility to realize it's... 
it's not going to be it's super easy, but it can be understood. It's very different, and it is a book that we need help with. We we need teachers, and that's why God's you know given teachers in the churches. And today we have so many resources. We always advocate for people to get a good study Bible. You get a good study Bible, you have all these neat footnotes by Bible scholars yeah. that really illuminate uh, even your first time through. You know. Not, not that I'm saying, okay, once you read it through, I've read it through, now I'm done. The Bible is a book that you read until you take your last breath. And um, you will be shocked at uh, how it continues to show its depth the more, the more years you, you get reading it. So, Yeah, and if you are kind of new to the reading of the Bible or not new to reading the Bible, we do have a Spiritual Work Out of the Day Facebook group in which we do a chapter a day and we kind of just discuss what we're learning there, what we're reading, and then we do that uh, Spiritual Work Out of the Day Facebook Live every Monday morning at 8 a.m. So that's a great place to kind of bounce ideas off other people, and uh, we're currently in the book of Acts, um, reading lots of interesting stuff there. Um, but we will move on to the next question. This person says, as the oldest of five, it can be hard to get one-on-one -on -one time with my parents. How will we get one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus in heaven when there are millions there? Well, I think the answer to that is, first of all, time won't exist. Okay, so you <laughs> you literally will have as much time as it takes, and Jesus, being divine, has a much larger capacity for individuals. I mean, he literally has capacity for intimacy with each and every being in the universe, unlike our parents or unlike ourselves, you know. Sure. Um, so the answer is, it's, it's one of the things I do think about, because down here in this life, we don't, we don't really have a lot of time to get intimate with many people, to be, to be frank, mm -hmm. to be honest. And, um, you know, when I hear people's uh, life story, which, you, you know, doing what I do, you get to hear a lot of these things, I, I'm always amazed that people are so, uh, so much more complex than you ever dreamt. And I'm always fascinated, you know, with uh, what, what, what a beautiful thing a human life is. But you don't have time down here to get that close to many people. And so I look forward to heaven having that, that luxury where there is no time. And literally, hey, you know, I'm going to just spend the next hundred years hanging out with you. You know, you can do that because there's no sense of time. Yeah. And Jesus will have plenty of time for individual attention with all of us. So it's, it's hard for us to envision um, a life without time. But uh, you will never be in a rush again. We'll never be tired again. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool to contemplate. <laughs> it is. And like we say a lot of times on here when it comes to heaven questions that maybe aren't super clear, we're pretty sure you're going to like it when you yes, get Yes, yes. <laughs> you yeah. won't be disappointed with what you find. Yeah, no matter, how, how, no matter what good we can envision, it will probably be way, way better than that. You yeah, know? So. exactly. Uh, but that is a good question. I, I see where you're coming from there. So we have... Um, our last question scheduled, then we will have one more that has come in. Okay. Um, but this person said, question for Tuesdays at 12. If I ask God for healing while also pursuing medical treatment, am I doubting like the James 1, 6 asker? Or can you give an example of what a double-minded situation might look like? How do I be single-minded in my prayers? So you might want to just kind of expand on what James 1, 6 is talking about. Yeah, um, well, well, James, the first chapter, you know, um, talks about if a person trusts God, and ask him for wisdom, okay, he will give wisdom. But then it warns, it says, but if you're a double-minded person, unstable in all your ways, he, he won't answer you. And what it's talking about is something very specific. It's saying, if I ask God for wisdom on a subject, he's only going to show me what would be his wisdom if I'm already in a state of trust. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm already in a state of mind where I'm going to do whatever you reveal your will to be. I'm not going to take your, your so, so God shows us, this is what I want you to do. Here, here's the wisdom answer. Here it is. And we say, ah, that's not what I want to do. That's a nice option. But I have the, uh, so if we're in that state of, you know, again, double-mindedness, where we're still waffling, uh, God's not going to bother to answer us is what they're saying. So you can't connect that, James 1, to James 5, which is talking about healing, which is what this person is talking about here. So in James 5, it says if a person is ill, if uh, here again, if they feel led, they go come to the elders of the church. They ask the elders of the church to pray for them and, and symbolically anoint them with oil, symbolizing the activity of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in the prayer of faith, it says we'll... It's, it's an interesting Greek word. It's a different word. It doesn't necessarily mean physically heal them. It does mean kind of raise them up. That, that can mean different things. Um, 
But it does essentially promise God's intervention in a very positive way if we're sick, okay? Again, does not mean we always get physically healed because people die. Best I can tell people, just keep on dying, you know, so obviously. So if a person is ill and uh, they're praying for healing, which I advocate you do, but they're also getting medical treatment, um, I find no contradiction. This doesn't mean that they're not trusting God. It just means that they are being responsible, in my mind, to use the means that are available for the age that we live in. You, you know, It's no different to me than if a person um, prays that God uh, supply their daily bread. You know, Jesus advocates that, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Well, the notion behind that, though, is that you're also going to get a job. <laughs> I remember years ago, I had a funny guy, well, not too funny, really, but a troubled guy. Let me rephrase that, in the church, and uh, he just wouldn't work, and he had a lot of kids, and his kids and his wife suffered greatly because he would not work, and he would he would use all this rubbish, you, you know, about, oh, you know, I just trust God, and God will it's provide. Like quail and manna. Yes, exactly, exactly, you know, and... Um, you know, God has given us the, the ability to work and to take care of ourselves. And so, to me, using the medical treatment that is available to you in a given age is not inconsistent with trusting God for healing. It just means that you're being a good steward to pray and to use the means that God has put before you at this particular age. It, it doesn't mean that you're not trusting God, you know. So that, that's the way I see that one. Very good. And so the last question that I believe came in um, from the feed there was about the Billy Graham rule. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's talking about um, Billy Graham's kind of policy on not going out to like lunch alone with a woman kind of thing. And then it resurfaced about last year, I think, with or a year or two ago with Mike Pence um, having said he followed that as well. This idea of, I'm not going to kind of be alone with whether right. I want my wife kind of thing. They were asking if you think that's biblical or where your stance is on that. Um, it's not as though there's any verse at all that, that says that. I think it might be wise. Um, he, here's the problem I do have with it, though. Now, now again, I'm not advocating recklessness at all. Uh, we, we live in a day and age where bad things happen, and there's a lot of temptation, and unfortunately it, it affects the churches as well as those outside the church. So <clears throat> I think we should all be very cautious about um, how we interact with people of the opposite sex and, and to try to be very above board, you know, and if that, if that means don't, not going to lunch or keeping your office door open or whatever it is, I think go ahead and do that. Um, I don't think it's a law. I don't think it's a rule. There's no biblical principle. But here's what I want to throw in here. It, frankly, protects you from nothing, okay? I have seen this through the years. There are people that will make things up and you have no defense against it. You may not have ever had this person ever in your office and they can come up with a tale about you that's very believable and very destructive. And anytime a tale like this is told, you're going to have people that, well, we don't know. Nobody's perfect. And that person is, is in a very difficult situation. They'll, they'll never clear themselves in the minds of, of everybody. We had a situation like this right in this church some years back. Didn't affect me, so I'm not not talking about that. But it was um, it was in a family where um, the, the the family had some children, and the children had uh, some friends sleep over. Okay, uh, one of the children that slept over charged, made up a story, as it turned out later, uh, about the father of that family having done some inappropriate things. Years later, after the damage was done, I'm talking big damage, you know, making probably many people suspicious that this guy was some kind of a pervert, you know. Years later, the kid admits that uh, they had made this up. So this Billy Graham law, this Billy Graham rule, it's, it's kind of naive in my opinion. I'm not saying be reckless. I'm saying be cautious. Um, but if the notion is, is that this will... Uh, make it impossible for one to ever um, have someone create false charges against them or something like that. It, it does Now, if that's what is necessary to protect you personally from temptation, if you know that you personally are struggling with temptation with people of the opposite sex, for goodness sake, do whatever you got to do. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know if Billy Graham's rule or maybe you got to make your own rule up. Okay? <laughs> Deal with it. But 
it's not the panacea, it's not the magic bullet. And, uh, and here's the fear that I have. I've watched Christians and Christians um, become legalistic through the years about things. You know, you just keep making rule after rule after rule. You think there's all these preventives, you know. I remember when my kids were going to uh, Christian school. This Christian school they went to, man, it was the most legalistic place I've ever seen in my life. Um, I, I wonder sometimes, why in the heck did I send them there? But anyway, um, they had so many rules that it, it just became bizarre, you know, and, and it actually created kind of a reverse reaction. You know what I mean? Particularly with kids, if the more you restrict and the more you hide them from things, sometimes the more eager they they, they want to know what's out there, you know. Yeah. And, um, and and the rules just get to the place of, of being bizarre. Here, here's one of the rules that used to crack me up the most. All right, well, they made all the girls wear their dresses where um, it, it was below their knees, and I'm cool with that. I don't have any problem with that. Um, but but then they made the boys wear shorts that were below their knees. And, 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 and then they had this thing that said, no mixed bathing. I'm like, what the heck is mixed bathing? Oh, so the boys had a swimming hole and the girls had a swimming hole. But you couldn't have a swimming hole together. Now, I get it. I know, I, I know, I know there's, there's room for temptation in those situations. But is, is that going to last? Is, is that, so you're going to go to Ocean City and the men are over here and the women. Hey, come on. Kids are going to face the real world sooner or later. Prepare them to face the real world. Uh, yes, we should guard them from um, too much too soon, you, you know, but, but you can't just keep assembling rules and practices and rules on top of rules to alleviate temptation. It is not going to work. Yeah. Uh, temptation has to be won authentically from the inside out between you and God. If it's not won authentically, if you're always fabricating things to keep you from, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, when you're in jail, you're not a thief because you can't steal, you know. <laughs> if, if that's how we function as Christians, um, there's something deficient in, in our Christian experience. So I, I, I hope I'm not leading anybody into temptation by this. But, but I'm saying, you know, man, you got to know yourself. If you're, if you're tempted by something, put up some boundaries. That's good. That's wise. Uh, until you get strengthened to the place where you no longer need those boundaries. But you should be growing where you don't need those things. Be wise when you're interacting with the opposite sex. But Billy Graham's rule is not magic. It's not a silver bullet, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think that did a good job of covering a lot of different aspects of it. You know, for some people it might work and they might need it, but it's not the end all be all, it's not going to be perfect. And I don't think it's limited to this either. I mean, you see people do that with all types of things. If they have a history of addiction or something. Yes. You know, for some people, it might be okay to be hanging out with people who are doing certain things, but for them, they have to set that kind of guardrail there and that boundary. It's very important. You have to know what your personal development is. There, there was a season in my life as a new Christian, and I've shared this before, I could not listen to, to rock music. Um, I was so a part of that culture that when I heard that stuff, man, it... it brought flashbacks to me about things I'd done and it, it was it was difficult I just literally stopped listening to all that sort of music for years just couldn't get around it now I can listen to it, it doesn't phase me at all likewise um, coming out of a culture where you know alcohol and drug use I, I was a part of that I went a long time where I couldn't get near anyone doing that now I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't go to bars or anything like that, but if I did, I'd never be tempted. I mean, sure. it's just, but, but it's, we have to be realistic at the stage of the spiritual development we have. And we're always in change. We're, 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 we're not at the same place, and so we've got to be very honest with God and ourselves, you know. And if putting up boundaries is what's necessary for a time, put them up. I'd rather see people uh, overdo that, but don't take your boundary and enforce it on everybody around yeah. you. This is where legalism starts, and this is where churches tend to go wrong. And you, you have this endless policy book of rules and regulations, and you know at some point they don't work. Yeah, and Jesus know. seemed to have a few things to say about you know the Pharisees doing that exact thing of exactly. make rules that you don't even get close to breaking them. Exactly. Kind of yes. Um, so yeah, very good point. I think that's all we have for today, though. Um, Let's look forward to this week. So we're in week two of our new series, Till I Met You. Um, who are we talking about this week? Um, we're talking about uh, being unable to do the things that God created us to do, okay. um, a, a type of spiritual paralysis. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a type of spiritual paralysis that is, generally speaking, connected to insufficiently resolved guilt, uh, fear and shame 
And so I don't want to give too much of it away, but if you're out there and you're a Christian that finds yourself frustrated sometimes because you want to do the will of God, but you find you're not able to do the will of God, but you end up doing the very thing that you don't want to do, um, this message might have something of value for you. you know, so. Awesome. Well, we are excited for that. If you missed last Sunday, make sure to uh, check that out on YouTube or on the podcast or wherever is most convenient for you on the website. Uh, but that's all we have for today. So until next week, you guys have a great week. We will see you Sunday. And that's all we got.